members that are a part of our body that um, that need to either take that step closer to Him or need to kind of um, just uh, to, to remain close to Him. They're in a very similar situation and, and need our prayers as we think about that uh, as far as the body goes. Listen, I know what time it is, but I'm going to preach and I'm going to qu- try to be quick because um, things that Cliff said, songs that people suggested for today, things that we've done, fit with the sermon. And so I feel like we need to, we need to look at that passage of Scripture this morning. So I'm going to ask you to turn to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14. I have told you before that we scare each other around this church, that um, through the week, Stacy and Teresa clean, and they clean with headphones in their ears. And I will, um, I'll make an errand in this building, and I'll come around the corner, and they are completely terrified. You know, their eyes get big, and they get, and they kind of step back, and they, you know what I mean? And, and uh, they can't hear my footsteps, cause, you know, they don't even know anybody's around, and then there I am, and. I'm, I tell them all the time, I'm a scary guy. You need to look out. I'm a scary guy. But then there's times where they have heard me coming, and so they hide around a corner because they want to return the favor, right? <laughs> and, um, you know, I'll, you know how you do. It, it catches you off guard. You, you do that. Your eyes get big, and, you, you know, you, you, you kind of m- maybe move away or whatever. You, you don't act r- rationally when you're afraid, Right? I remember my mom being afraid of uh, bees, and there's a, there's a bumblebee, I think. It wasn't going to hurt her, but I, had, I was a little boy, had a little plastic set of golf clubs, and she destroyed those golf clubs <laughs> trying to swing at that bee. She hit other stuff and broke them all to pieces because you don't act rationally when you're afraid, right? Psychologists would tell us, or, or most of us have heard, right, that there are essentially two responses to fear. When we get afraid, many times we either, there's either, you, you even know the response, right? It's a fight or flight response. And so you, you might respond to fear in those two different ways. So like if you were to think about, um, for, uh, I'm, I'm afraid of snakes, right? So let's say that, that you're afraid of snakes and you're walking, down the, you're walking through the woods and a snake falls out of a tree and lands on you. A person who has a fight response would take that snake and throw that snake off of them and stomp it. They might do something to, to, to fight that snake away from them, right? A person who, who's a flight response kind of person, they're going to run. That snake lands on them. They don't even know if the snake's still on them or not. They just want to run and get out of there and get away from that area, right? So they take off, right? And, and it, I don't know what it has to do with your personality as to how you react to fear, but, but that's what psychologists tell us, either a fight or flight response, right? I sort of believe that. I remember watching, uh, because I would say that there's a third response, and I I think psychologists would kind of go along with this too. If you, uh, I remember watching one of these shows, like, uh, you know, it tells you how your brain works, how you think, and how your brain operates. And it was talking about that there's actually a third response to fear. So there's flight, uh, fright, or uh, what I said, fight, flight, or freeze. Freeze is another response, right? Where you might become so overwhelmed, there's so much stimuli coming your way that you don't do anything. To demonstrate this, they, I remember in the show they, uh, they took some people into a, like a haunted house kind of place and they had people make noises and, and touch them and, and do things to them. They were blindfolded. They were tied to this chair and they were blindfolded in this haunted house and they were doing these things to them and they were attached to heart monitors. And so uh, one particular guy was tied in the chair and when the scary things started happening to him, he, he started screaming threats, you know? You better quit. You better be glad I'm tied to this chair. I'd get up and kill you, you know? He screamed. He wanted to, to, to threaten that, that fear away. There were other people that there was uh, one particular lady, when people would touch her, she would, even though she was tied down, she would move as far away as she could from that touch. She would scream, and if she wasn't tied down, she would have been flying out of the room, right? There were other people that when the frightening things happened, They sat as still as they could in that chair. And if you, if they were not attached to the heart monitors, you would say to yourself, that person's not afraid at all. They're just not affected by this at all. But the heart monitors were showing their their blood pressure, their, their heart rate was elevated, right? Their breathing changed. They were afraid. 
But it was almost like a possum playing dead, right? It's this freeze response. And if you think about how people deal with storms in life, if you think about how people deal with conflict and trouble in life, things that cause us to be fearful, you know how people respond? Some people do it with fight. They're going to get strong. They're going to man up. They're going to tackle this problem. They're going to face it head on. And they're going to, they're going to muster up some kind of inner strength to deal with this storm that they're facing. It's the fight response, right? Some people, they, they go with the flight response. They don't want to deal with it at all. They want to get out of the situation as fast as possible. They're looking for a way out of the trouble. And if they can't find a way out of the trouble, they'll stick their head in the sand or they'll do some way to kind of deny that the issue's even there. They try to just blind themselves to the problem because they don't want to deal with the problem, right? Some people freeze. Some people get to the point where they are just, the, the fear, the circumstances around them immobilizes them to fear, and they don't do anything. They, in the middle of the storm, they just don't do anything. They're, they're waiting it out. They're just kind of waiting, hoping it will, they, they will ride out whatever storm or trouble it is in their life. I want to propose to you today a fourth way that you and I can deal with fear. I would say that, and it, look, it works great. This is not my outline, but isn't it perfectly alliterated that some people fight, some people flight, some people freeze, but some people have faith. Some people respond to fear. Fear is even another. Fear, that respond to fear in faith. And so that's what we want to talk about today, facing fear with faith. Let's read this passage of scripture in um, Matthew 14. We're going to start in verse 22. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, Take heart, it's I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand, took hold of him, saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. I need to hurry today, because even though I have... Um, about a fourth of the time that I usually do. I also have two more points than I usually do. So I need to move. Let me say this to you. Let me give you some ways that we can react or we can face fear with faith. I'm going to give five things that we need to remember. First thing I would say to you is this. We need to remember that Jesus is sovereign over you. If you want to respond to these fearful things with faith, Jesus is sovereign over you. Over you. Notice in the first part of this passage, from what we read last week, Jesus fed the 5,000. And if you'll remember in that moment that he, um, that when the, they were, the, Jesus and the disciples were trying to get away from the crowd. Remember last time? And then the crowd comes and Jesus sees their need and he ministers to them. So even prior to him feeding the 5,000, they were trying to get away for rest and relaxation and to recharge and to, be, and to be alone in prayer. Jesus was looking for that. But then he ministered to the crowd, and so now as he gets the disciples on a boat, and he sends them across the Sea of Galilee, yet he goes around. He goes to the mountain to pray. But verse 22 very clearly tells us that it was Jesus who made the disciples get in the boat. They were very accustomed to sailing at night, to being on the water at night, these disciples were. Their custom as fishermen, many of them were fishermen, those fishermen in that day would fish all night long, catch those fish, and it would be ready for them to take to the market when the sun came up and people were going to the market during the day to buy, the fish would be there in the market. Um, during which the morning they would repair nets and, and get things ready for the next night to go out. They'd go home and catch a nap 
and get ready to go again the next night, right? So they were used to being on the water at night. And so that's what's happening here. After the day, Jesus sends them out on the boat at night, and then he walks around. Now, I don't want to get bogged down in this, but you need to know that it was a long time that they were on that boat by themselves. Jesus sent them off by... So this, if you think about it happening in the evening, maybe before the sun goes down, they get on the boat. And then later on in the passage, we understand that Jesus comes walking to them in the fourth watch of the night. The Jews would have divided the, the night up into four different watches. And so there were three-hour watches. So if you were on watch, first watch, it would be from 6 o'clock in the evening until 9 at night, and then from 9 to 12, and then 12 to 3, and then 3 to 6. So when Jesus comes walking to them on the water, it's sometime around 3 in the morning to 6 o'clock in the morning. They've been on this boat for at least six hours or so by themselves. And Jesus is the one who sent them there. Did you notice that? In verse 22, Jesus put them on the boat. And I want to say even the King James uses this word. He constrained them to get onto the boat. Did Jesus know that there was a storm coming? Did Jesus know it was getting dark? Did Jesus intentionally put these disciples on the boat by themselves in the dark to go right into a storm. Yep, he sure did. And we would often question that or we might wonder about that, but he oftentimes will put us in the middle of the storm. This entire episode was by his design. Right? Sometimes we go through storms of life because of correction. Right? Like if you look at the story of Jonah, Jonah gets involved in a storm in his story. God sends a storm his way because Jonah needs to be corrected and get on a different path. And sometimes in life we face storms because of correction. But other times there's storms of perfection in our life. That's what's going on here. This is like a, a faith increasing exercise in the life of the disciples. And so Jesus puts them on the boat. He knows their situation inside and out. In fact, he has orchestrated their circumstances inside and out. He is sovereign. He's sovereign over you, and he's sovereign over me. And when we find ourselves in times of feel fearful circumstances, know that he is sovereign over all things. He knows our situation. It's by his design. He knows our weaknesses, and he is working all things together for our good. If we want to face it with faith, first thing you remember is Jesus is sovereign over you. Secondly, I would say this. Jesus is interceding for you. It's interesting to me that in verse 22, he sends them out. But then in 23 and 24, in 23 and 24, he, send, he goes to the mountain to pray. He goes to pray. During the time that they are on the water, in the dark, in the storm, Jesus is praying for them. Now, if you're going through a tough time, and I were to come up to you and I were to say to you, um, Dan, I'm, I know you're going through a rough time and I'm praying for you. That might encourage you, right? It might, if you had somebody come up to you and say something like that, it might encourage you to know that you were not in that alone, that someone else was lifting you up in prayer. How much more would it change the situation if you knew that Christ himself is lifting you up in prayer? Jesus did this, right? Jesus went away. I'm not going to read all the scripture references for time's sake, but there are so many places in scripture that tell us that Jesus would often go away to pray to recharge. We also know that when he went, when he went away to pray, when he got by himself and he prayed, he prayed for his disciples. Remember with Peter? Simon, Simon, the devil desires to have you, but I have prayed for you, right? That you'll turn and you'll bolster your brothers and you'll be, you know, that you'll... Jesus prayed for his disciples, and you know, the Bible tells us that you and I have not been left alone. In fact, if you were in Sunday school this morning, your lesson might have been from Romans 8. And Romans 8 and 26 talks about this idea. Romans 8 and 26 says that likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we don't know what to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us. When we don't know what to pray... He's leading us and guiding us, and his spirit is within us as a believer praying for us. The Bible also tells me this, that what Jesus is doing, like when I say, like on this point, I say Jesus is interceding for you, and that's interceding. That's really a pretty churchy word, right? It's not a word that we use, that I don't know that I use anywhere other than church, right? 
And so this is the idea of praying and me standing in the gap for you. Right? He's going through something in his life, and I stand in the gap for Heath. I say, Lord, I am coming on Heath's behalf. I'm, through this prayer, I'm representing Heath and his circumstances, and I'm bringing this to you. It's great we have brothers and sisters in Christ that intercede for us, right? But what does the Bible tell us? Who is at the right hand of the Father right now ready to intercede on behalf of sinners? 1 Timothy tells us there is one mediator between God and man, and that is Jesus Christ. The Bible calls him our, our intercessor, our advocate, our mediator, right? If you think about that for a moment, you think about how a lawyer would argue your case in court. That's what he's doing for you. He's arguing your case before the Father. He's standing there re ready to make this. He is that, that go-between between holy God and sinful man. His sacrifice on the cross bridges the gap between the two. Here in this passage, he was praying and lifting up them in prayer. He was, he's sovereign over us. Jesus is sovereign over you. Second thing to remember, Jesus is interceding for you. Thirdly, Jesus is present with you. Jesus is present with you. Look at verse 25. They're on the boat. They're afraid. Fourth watch of the night, Jesus comes, and Jesus appears to them. And when the disciples saw him, they were terrified, and they said, it was a ghost and then Jesus said to them, take heart, don't be afraid. That language that he uses in verse 27 is very reminiscent of what you've, the language you hear from the burning bush. When God speaks to Moses and says, don't be afraid, I'll be with you. I am present with you. Just like the poem that Cliff read a while ago, a lot of times when we're afraid, we act irrationally because we think he's left us in a lurch and he's left us all alone and we're out here on this limb all by ourselves, and he's nowhere around and we forget those promises that he's given us over and over and over again. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Even when it comes to the mission that he's given us as believers to reach this world with the gospel, he begin, before he ever gives the mission, remember, he says... All authority is given to me in heaven and earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and, lo, I am with you. We're not alone. He hasn't left us alone. That's the whole redemption story of the Bible, that we are not alone to find our own way for salvation. He is with us, and so therefore we have no reason to fear. Let's move to point four. Jesus is sovereign over you. Jesus is interceding for you. Jesus is present with you. But fourthly, Jesus is strength in you. Jesus is strength in you. When you get down to verse 28 through 31, you find Peter acting. He recognizes that it's Jesus. And because when he recognizes that it's Jesus, then Peter associates with Jesus this power and authority that he can act in the power and the authority of Jesus. He recognizes that he does not have the power. I mean, I don't think that when Peter asked this question, Peter thought that he was going to get out of the boat and walk on the water and he was going to be doing anything. His recognition when he gets out of the boat is, I'm going to walk on the water, but I'm going to walk on the water because you are going to enable me to do this. Right? That was, that's kind of the idea. In fact, in this particular passage where Peter says to him, Lord, that idea, that idea of Lord is reflecting this idea of the kingship of Christ. This idea of bid me, the King James says, bid me to come unto you. It's language that you would use of highest respect, the way that you might ask permission to approach royalty. King Jesus, allow me to come to you. There's a, there's a deference given, recognizing that the strength is not in Peter. Peter recognizes that the strength is in him, is in Christ. And so then it talks about him getting out and, and he walked on the water and, and came to Jesus. Look at verse 30. But then he saw the wind and he became afraid and he began to sink. We know, right? He took his eyes off Jesus. We've heard people talk about this before. He took his eyes off Jesus. What struck me this particular time as I studied this was Jesus' response to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? He did not um, berate Peter for having no faith. 
it was this idea of little faith. The idea that Peter begins to look on, um, on outward circumstances, right? And I believe when we begin to do that, that, that causes us to have fear, right? Faith is not something that you and I muster up. Jesus was not telling him, if you'd have just had enough faith, you could have walked on the water, right? You see, I was watching a TV show the other day, and somebody was talking about the fact, oh, I can do this because my faith is strong, it's really a faulty belief, right? You see, faith is only as strong as the object in which we have placed our faith. So if I think about, um, you know, if I'm a rich person and I put my faith in money and I put my faith in all my money to whatever else, if the money goes away, my faith is dependent on the object of that thing, right? Right? If I put my faith in, in my own ability or in my own connections or in my own anything like that, right? Then it, my faith is only as strong as I am. But see, when I put my faith in Christ, the object of my strength is what matters. It doesn't matter how hard I believe. What matters is the strength of the object of my faith. Warren Wiersbe, when talking about this passage, says this, Peter started out great, with great faith, but he ended up with little faith because he saw two ways instead of one way. And that's the idea. This idea when Jesus says, oh, you have little faith, why did you doubt? That doubt comes to this idea of standing in a crossroad and having two ways to go and not knowing which way they are. If I recognize that Jesus is the strength in me, there's not another option, right? Right? My own strength is not an option. It's not an option for the object of my faith. The only option that I have is the strength that he has. That's the only avenue. And through that, Peter's faith would have remained strong. If he would have kept his eyes there, recognizing that Jesus was the only way, the only way to strength. Jesus is sovereign. Let me give you a fifth one. Jesus is sovereign over you. Jesus is interceding for you. He's present with you. His strength is in you. But fifthly, Jesus is peace around you. In verse 32, when Jesus got into the boat, the wind and the waves immediately stopped. Is that a coincidence? There was peace in the weather and there began to be this peace that settled in their hearts because it says in the passage that when he got into the boat, the wind ceased. Look at verse 33. And those in the boat worshipped him saying, truly you are the storm, the Son of God. He said, David, you don't know my circumstances. You don't know, uh, you don't know how the wind is whipping around. You don't know about the, the things that I'm facing in that way, David. I don't feel like the wind stopped. And I don't feel like Jesus has brought peace in my circumstances. There's an unknown, the quote is not attributed to anybody in particular that says sometimes the Lord calms the storm, sometimes he lets the storm rage and he calms the child. And that's where we are, right? But as we talked about in Sunday school this morning, and at least in our class, that the circumstances around us may be upheaval, right? Those circumstances may be leading us to God. Those circumstances may be negative things that God's using to direct us somewhere. But apart from all of that, if our faith is in him and him alone, it don't matter what's going on in the circumstances because the circumstances are temporary. They come and they go. Listen, I would ask you to pray for, I would ask you to pray for um, the Inspire Weekend. Um, that's where Waylon is this morning and I was there yesterday and Friday. And um, Yesterday, in the middle of the day, there's um, a pastor from over in Trenton uh, Hutch Garmony, who shares um, his, his talk um, is uh, on the soul. And here's how Hutch approaches that talk. I want to share with you just a little bit of how the kind of the approach that Hutch gives in that talk. He says this. He says, every one of us have a soul. That soul is that piece, that part of us that makes us us, right? It's not your body. It's not your spirit. It's your soul, right? And, and then he says this. Your soul cannot satisfy itself, your soul is thirsty to be satisfied with something. And so people look for all sort of ways to be satisfied, right? We, we're hungering for that. We're looking for that. We're finding, we're wanting to find something that will satisfy us. 
In fact, what he begins to talk about are the things that your soul delights in, the things that they delight in, that's, that's worship. When your soul delights in something, that's worship. And so anything that you find, anything that you attach your, your soul to, whatever you entrust your soul to will determine your destination, your destiny. And so he begins to talk about how, how we worship and what we worship and the fact that everybody alive has a soul and everybody alive is worshiping something. What is the place in your life that you have given the, the most passion that you have connected your soul to? He begins to talk about the fact that Jesus Christ is the only thing that satisfies the soul. But he asks those, those um, sojourners to think about what they've attached their soul to, what they, what they get upset about when it goes away, what they love and are most passionate about, right? That is the only talk of the whole weekend where there's question and answer. And so after he's done, he just opens it up and he allows people to talk and he allows people to share. You know what the realization among some of those sojourners was yesterday? I have put all of my worth in getting my dad's approval. I've put all my worth in trying to please the people that are around me. That's what I've attached my soul to. And they, you know, more open than I've heard in any of those question and answer times with Hutch, that was what they talked about yesterday. And we got back in that room and we began to talk about, um, even though there weren't any decisions made right then, after that thing, what we began to talk about, what Hutch and I began to talk about was, one of the ladies in the room said, if you attach your soul to anything that's temporal, and that was the word she used, and I could tell that the girl that was sitting right in front of her, looking up to her, had no idea what temporal meant. They were like, question, if I could have comic booked it, there would have been question marks all over her head. And then she even asked her, when you say temporal, and she said anything that's not eternal, and she began to di differentiate between the two. We walked away and we went to the room and I told Hutch this. I said, listen, they're starting to realize and recognize that whether it's your dad or whether it's your friends or the people you're close to, all of those things are temporary. You understand, if our soul thirsts for something, he's the only thing that's eternal and lasts and stays and is faithful, right? Everything apart from him is not creator but creation. You were made for him. You were made to worship him and you were made to serve him. And so if you are trying to attach your worth to anything else other than him, you'll be disappointed. And if in those most fearful moments of your life, you attach your hope to the fight response in you or the flight response, or you don't know what to do and you freeze, it won't be reacting in faith because he is the only one. He, he is creator. He's, the, he's in a category all by himself. And I would say this to you. If you're here this morning and you don't know him as Lord and Savior, you can buck up against that message. I don't need Jesus. I'm not interested in that. And you could have a fight response to the gospel. You could have a flight response. I don't want anything to do with that stuff, David. I don't want anything to do with it. I've heard enough and you could... You could freeze, and in a minute we could play a song, and you could recognize that you need to do something but be overcome by all of that and just simply freeze and not respond to him. But we're fixing to sing a song. And if he's calling to your heart today, I'm going to ask you to respond in faith to him. Come recognizing that eternity is a fearful place without resting securely in his hands. And so it's no different when we go through these circumstances here. They're scary. Unless we find ourselves resting in the sovereign hands of Jesus Christ. We heads bowed and your eyes closed as they come and get a hymn of invitation together. As those that are going to be baptized come and um, we get prepared to do that. I'm going to ask you this morning to consider where you stand with him. And I would say that a good indicator of what you believe about Jesus might be what you do with him in those fearful moments. When you have a fearful moment, do you get your eyes focused on temporary things? Is that all you seem to be able to see? Are you able to look to him 
the author and perfecter of your faith. Lord, we come to you this morning confessing that there are so many things around us that um, could cause us to be fearful. Lord, I pray that we would not put our eyes on any of them. But then in the next few minutes, our eyes would be solely fixed upon you. Lord, in the light of your glory and grace, everything else, we would see it as it is. Creation. Under your sovereign control. Lord, I pray that this morning, I, I, I'm sure that there are some people in this room right now that are facing fear of uncertainty of future events. Lord, that are facing uh, a bad diagnosis. Facing fear about financial issues or relationship things. I know that there's people in this room that are dealing with those very things. But Lord, I know that if we take our lives and we put it in your sovereign hands, you, you're able to use us. You're able to endue us with strength. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. So Lord, I pray that right now, we would find the courage to respond to you in faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and sing. It's 413. Oh,